Welcome everyone. We invite you to grab a pen and paper. And if you aren't that kind of person, uh, a digital device that you will be able to use after our meditation. Stacy, you want to do the introduction, or shall I take it away? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I want to say something about you, my Dharma sister. So uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome back to our Truth and Justice Vigil. We've been holding this space uh, since the beginning of the uh, trial for Derek Chauvin and the murder of George Floyd. And our intention has been to uh, bear witness not only to what's arising in our own hearts, uh, how that moves and influences how we hold and engage with one another. And so I have been blessed to uh, be on retreat and be in many spaces with Dr. Anouk Shambrook, uh, who's been practicing and teaching for 20 years. And after a very serious illness, um, reconsidered what this life is all about and uh, started beginning to look more closely at these intersections of trauma and social justice, race and spirituality. And so I am so pleased that she raised her, she didn't raise her hand, I asked her and she said yes. <laughs> she accepted the invite uh, and so happy to have her here with us tonight to walk with us on this journey of uh, cultivating the courage that it takes to turn toward one another in this racialized world that we're in. And so with that, Dr. Sham Brook. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy, And thank you to each of you. Uh, my name is Anouk Sham Brook. I go by the pronoun she, her. I'm in Ohlone territory, also known as Oakland, California. And I uh, just want to Give thanks to um, my uh, teachers in the Tibetan Buddhist lineage, uh, Vajrayana, Zongzo Chensei Rinpoche, Lama Trine Norbu, and Chakti Rinpoche. And I'd also um, like to give thanks to each of you. From what I understand, the turnout used to be uh, significantly larger before the verdict. And I really feel for you to be showing up, it indicates that. Uh, you realized that even though there was a very important victory, that the system itself hasn't been changed. And so I really admire your commitment to trying to help bring about that change. And as Stacy was saying, you know, cultivate the courage to turn towards one another. So just to give you uh, an overview of this evening, uh, of course, we'll start with refuge, establishing our motivation, then I'm gonna give you a brief background on why it's important to listen to our body and how that's key to healing our individual and collective racial wounds. I'll lead you in a guided meditation. And after the meditation, you'll have a couple of minutes to write or draw um, kind of what arose for you in the meditation and what body sensations you notice. So I was inviting folks to grab a pen and paper or if you prefer to be electronic, to have that option without disconnecting from the Zoom session. And we'll have a dyad and then we'll come back for a group share and Q and A. And I am a meditation teacher, um, but today is not gonna be a traditional Dharma talk. Uh, I was speaking with Stacy about the intention behind this truth and justice vigil and uh, I've adapted the session for what I believe people are gathered here for, um, orienting our voices and choices towards healing, courage, and freedom, and working to lessen the grip of habitual and historical tendencies, like not only of fear and hatred, but also of indifference and disillusionment. So we really were excited to have people in it for the long haul. Uh, and with that, then uh, we'll go ahead and start by taking refuge. <sighs> I take refuge in the Buddha, 
I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. And in, uh, in my Buddhist lineage, we, uh, we always follow that by establishing our motivation. And the idea of relative and absolute compassion exists in many cultures around the world, including South Africa. And that music was uh, from South Africa. <laughs> I hope it brought a little joy into the space. Joy is part of uh, what keeps us going. And um, there's a South African expression, Ubuntu, and it can be translated loosely as I am because we are. And so I invite you to feel into how we are all in interconnected. All of us on this Zoom call, you can switch from speaker mode to gallery mode if you'd like to see everyone else. Um, and we're connected with other two-legged and four-legged creatures as well as the, the wind and guild, and even the earth itself, the earth that sustains us. So feeling into that connection, I inv invite you for a cycle of breath as you breathe in, to breathe in your intention to benefit all beings, and as you breathe out, to breathe out that offering. Oh. These truth and justice vigils um, are centered in part around addressing racism and how we close ourselves off to other humans who may look differently than we do. And when we close our hearts, we end up suffering as well. So addressing this is really a question of humanity and not of politics. Uh, as a, a Buddhist teacher, Larry Ward said, we are a nation out of alignment with the depth of our humanity. And in case we didn't know, um, given what we're gathering around, uh, last month there was a commission, an international commission from 11 different countries that uh, created a report holding the US accountable for the long history of police violence, saying that it violates international law and in some cases rises to the level of crimes against humanity. So I just really want to emphasize again that I think we're gathering here because of our shared sense of humanity. And uh, my parents are immigrants and I love that they would often share perspectives from outside of the country. And, you know, there are other methods of policing, like the police in the US kill more people in one day than the police in most developed nations kill in one year. So while it isn't a simple fix, there are options. So I just wanted to like address the big picture before we start getting into, okay, so we're Buddhists and we wanna become more deeply aligned with our depth of humanity around racism. So what do we do? So that's really what we will be exploring today. Um, so, Policies and procedures and laws are extremely important, um, but if we want true lasting change, it requires each of us to address the racism that lives in our bodies. And during the meditation, we're going to be ch checking into our body sensations, and I thought it might be helpful to provide a little background. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So maybe taking a deep breath as we transition into the technological world. So typically when we think of our brain, we think of our thinking brain, you know, Descartes, I think therefore I am. And that thinking brain communicates in words and you know, we have a lot of words. Buddhists have a lot of words. <laughs> our limbic brain is the emotional part it's the one that uh, assesses risk and it also is linked to our social engagement with others. And then the survival brain is instinctual. 
uh, it carries out the fight, flight, freeze of keys, it's unconscious, and it communicates through body sensations, not through words. So if we would like to have a sense of feeling settled instead of triggered every time just the topic of race comes up, then we need to learn how to bring about well-being in our nervous system. And there are three typical doorways, thinking, feeling, and sensing. And the sensing doorway is one that we often overlook, and that's uh, our body, body sensations. So racism lives in our bodies, and we don't normally think of it. We think of it as something out there or maybe a prejudice in some habitual way of thinking. But literally, if we don't start taking into account the, our body's knee-jerk reaction when the survival brain hijacks us, then we won't have sustained change because racism doesn't just live in our thinking brains, it lives and breathes in our bodies. And so uh, you might wonder after, you know, there's been a fair amount of money invested in uh, racial diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And again, most of it doesn't take into account this, this fact that when race comes up, often we don't feel safe. When we don't feel safe, our survival brain hijacks our thinking brain and we don't have access to our best self. And uh, Larry Ward speaks of compassion, one of our favorites in Buddhism, as an openness to our lived human experience down to our toes, an openness to deep change, an invitation to recover our right to empathy. It's creating enough space within to hold the light and shadow of America's racial karma without being destroyed by it because you are healing and releasing the traumatic memories in your body of ages of your ancestors' innocent suffering as well as your own. So for some of us, uh, this idea that we have uh, trauma in our bodies might feel a little foreign, um, but we can literally have intergenerational trauma. They've shown that um, you know, research with uh, like grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, as well as other research. And, and so if we're to move forward, then we need to learn how to, in a sense, deepen our capacity to handle the stress that comes up when the topic of race comes up. And uh, this, this author of a book that many of you may be familiar with, um, Resmad Menachem, he refers to clean and dirty pain. And clean pain is the pain, it still hurts like hell. <laughs> it isn't easy, but the thing is that with clean pain, we actually come out the other side. And it's literally experiencing the unpleasant and sometimes painful sensations when our body perceives a threat. And dirty pain is the pain of avoidance. It's the pain of blame and denial. And when we have the dirty pain, then we tend to act from the most wounded part of ourselves. And healing trauma involves recognizing, accepting, and moving through clean pain. So that's part of what we're going to experiment with today. And during the meditation, I will offer you invitations and I trust you to do what, what resonates. Um, so the, the, the great thing about us having meditation practice is we have practice of kind of developing this capacity of a witness, right? So a thought comes and we don't get carried away by it. Um, similarly, if we have a strong emotion, then we can kind of stay centered while the emotions pass through, kind of like clouds in the sky. And it's similar about our physical sensations. What's going to be a little different in this uh, meditation practice is after we resource, I'm going to invite you to listen to the body sensations so that you can become familiar with them and start to recognize them in other situations where you aren't in the safety of your home and 
listening to someone on Zoom that you can turn off at any moment and to start developing the capacity to work with those body sensations. And, you know, at the beginning, Stacy was speaking to, can we bear witness to the violence that happens? And can we have the courage to be fully present and have honest conversations with each other? So learning how to settle our nervous system is an important piece and foundation for that. Um, after the meditation, we will have a couple of minutes to, uh, to kind of reflect on, uh, on what arose for you in the meditation. And I'd like to suggest that part of what we're doing in a sense is kind of like when you're on an airplane and, uh, and someone says, you know, put on your, your own oxygen mask first before you help others. And as Buddhists, we have this aspiration, you know, we want to, we want to move towards freedom so that we can have collective freedom. And part of our practice is learning to do that for ourselves so that we can be a resource for others. And I'll be asking you to notice your body sensations. Um, they say that tracking sensations is like an internal GPS. You can't get lost if you know where you are. And so after the meditation, I'll have you kind of draw a little bit of your sensations. And then we're going, oh, okay, I see a smile. So <laughs> this is an example where someone was saying, oh, I had butterflies in my stomach, you know, here, or I noticed my foot was tapping, maybe I was a little nervous, or maybe I wanted to run, um, you know, maybe my hand wanted to punch something, and or maybe I just felt like a pressure in my, in my head. So those are just some examples. Uh, in the dyads, I, I just wanna establish this now so that right after the meditation, we don't have to deal with this. It's important to feel that we're for each other, uh, to stay engaged and present instead of checking out. Ideally to talk straight, to resist saying what you think is expected, to experience discomfort and take care of yourself. Um, I imagine that someone has spoken about the difference between intent and impact. And so if it turns out that something that you said with good intent had a, a hurtful impact, then we can say, you know, oops and ouch, take accountability. Expect and accept non-closure. So, you know, years ago when you started meditation, you know, someone might've said, oh, all you do is sit and watch your mind. And it sounds simple, <laughs> but it's a journey. Um, and, and racism has been around for quite a while. So this is just a, a first step in that process. And then perhaps most importantly is to maintain confidentiality. So if someone shares something, don't share it with others and don't bring it up with them afterwards because in another context, they may not feel comfortable talking about it. So I'd like to just ask with a a show of hands, whether it's your virtual reaction hand or your physical hand, um, are, for, are folks willing to agree with these agreements, these group agreements? Okay, great. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Um, so the meditation will also not be traditional. Um, and, uh, and then Yvonne, I'll just, oh, perfect. Um, and so we're going to actually start by doing practices that help settle the nervous system, because the more settled our nervous system is, the greater our capacity is to open up to our own suffering and the suffering of others. And it's when we are closed off to life that we're not really present and we aren't, uh, we aren't living up to our full potential and we aren't in a sense uh, honoring Buddha's Four Noble Truths. So with that, then I invite everyone to get in a comfortable position, ideally something with your back straight that doesn't need to be rigid. Um, if any of you need to lie down, you can just as long as you don't think that's so conducive to falling asleep, I'll let you be the judge. <laughs> And we're going to start by humming and rocking. I'll get my phone. We're just going to do it for 60 seconds. 
And when we do it, uh, the vibration, the physical vibration actually helps settle our nervous system. So I'm gonna invite you to hum out loud. Now, if I can do it here on Zoom with you know, a number of strangers, I hope that you in the privacy of your home would feel comfortable doing it. Again, it is the, the vibration that makes a difference. So just starting to hum. And then you keep humming, I'll offer some guidance. If it feels supportive, you can rock a little as you hum. You can rock back and forth or side to side. And keep humming. I invite you to feel the vibration in your belly. See as you hum, if you can feel it all the way down in your belly, or you can put your hand there. And finally, see if you can feel the hum vibrating your feet all the way down to your feet. Gradually letting the hum dissolve. I invite you to bring into our circle a resource. It can be an ancestor, it can be a spiritual teacher, a friend a pet, a tree, a place in nature you find supportive. And just really call that into your heart mind and feel their presence in this moment. It could be a beautiful beach or mountain you've been to, what it looked like, sounded like, smelled like. Could be a grandparent or caretaker and the smell of their cooking, or your pet looking up at you lovingly. So really take a moment to soak in the presence of that resource. And now I invite you to notice what happens in your body in the presence of that resource? Is your breathing deeper or shallow? Is your heart rate faster or slower? Maybe even do a body scan, starting with the feet, noticing any pleasant or neutral sensations, the calves, thighs. If you notice anything unpleasant, then you can just notice it and keep moving on to the pleasant or neutral ones. Scanning the pelvis, the lower back, the belly, the upper back, the chest, your hands, arms, shoulders, neck, and head. And then I invite you to uh, drop into your body noticing the contact between your legs and the chair, the contact between your feet and the earth. Can you feel your heart beating? 
Can you feel the weight of your clothes on your back? Can you feel the air moving in and out as you breathe? I invite you to allow the earth to come up and meet you. The earth's gravity offers you a sense of belonging right here, right now. Perhaps surrender just a couple more pounds of your weight to the earth and allow yourself to be held. Now I invite you to bring your attention to your heart, to a sense of warmth and openness. And to relax into the ground of being, into your essence, your Buddha nature. Relax into your essence that can never be harmed, into your basic goodness. From this place of resource, I invite you to allow your heart to be touched by the uncomfortable truth of this moment in history. And notice what happens in your body when you open to the uncomfortable truth that this chauvin verdict of guilty is not an end, but just a beginning. Notice what happens inside your body without any judgment. If you feel up to it, I invite you to allow your heart to be touched by the horrific history of violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. to be touched by the genocide of indigenous people in this country. Notice what sensations arise in your body. Is there a contraction or expansion? Is there a pit in your stomach or is your belly relaxed? If you don't notice any sensations in your body, Notice if you start to unconsciously dissociate, to tune out of unpleasant bodily sensations and disappear into the thought world. There's no judgment, it's a survival mechanism. Feel into your capacity in this moment, staying connected to your resource, that person, place, pet, or spiritual teacher who helps you feel more centered, more resilient. And if you're not overwhelmed by trauma in this moment, how might it feel to come back into the body to begin feeling, to come back more fully to this present moment and what is arising in this moment? feel up to it, I invite you to uh, 
open your heart to be touched by the reality that we're putting immigrant children in cages at the border. To be touched by the violence against black people, including by the police just 10 miles away from the trial of the murderer of George Floyd. If you burp or yawn or experience strange sensations, this can be a sign of old patterns releasing from your body. So the invitation is to see if you can allow them to move through. Just notice if you bring up a specific example that we've been talking about of racialized violence. Are you going into a freeze state like a deer in the headlights? Do you feel shame or wanting to shrink? Do you feel defensive or angry? Are your fists clenched? Is heat rising? Are you sweating? Are your muscles trembling? Are you feeling sadness? Do you feel heaviness in your chest? or body aches, is there a lump in your throat, or a sinking feeling in your stomach? So as we start bringing the meditation to a close, I invite you to connect with your resource again, to vividly call to mind the presence of that person, pet, maybe that beautiful place in nature that helps you feel connected to safety, maybe helps you feel more resilient. And if it feels supportive, I invite you to take some deep breaths focusing your attention on the temperature of the air as it enters your nose and the temperature as you breathe out. Before you open your eyes, I'm gonna offer some guidance um, but when we do get to opening our eyes, I invite you to not look at Zoom on your electronic device. Instead, I invite you to just look down, say to your pen and paper. And I invite you to imagine your eyes are like windows and to experiment with what it feels like to stay inside the windows of your eyes. So your attention stays inside, still connected with your essence and whatever you experience during the meditation. And so when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes and maybe look down at your pen and paper. And I'm going to just have you reflect on what were the body sensations that you noticed when you are connecting with the resource, that person, pet, place, or thing. And then what were the body sensations when I brought up examples of our racist reality and that the verdict of guilty for Chauvin is just the beginning, not the end. Were you able to observe without judging?
I'll give you one more minute and then we'll go into dyads. So in the dyads, we're gonna have two rounds. Um, uh, in the first round, each person will share for two minutes and we'll just share what body sensations did you notice? And then uh, after you've each shared in the second round, we'll be exploring what if listening to your body sensations and settling your nervous system were necessary to see humanity in each other, to lessen the grip of these habitual and historical racist tendencies. What would you do differently in your life? Like what concrete next steps might you take? So again, it's going to be two minutes each. And so the first cycle with two people sharing will be four minutes. And then the second cycle, same thing, two minutes each, a total of four minutes. And I'd just like to remind you of our confidentiality. And to simplify things, this time, the person with the shortest hair will share first in the first cycle and then in the second cycle, the person with the longest hair will share first. Great. So with that, we'll open up the breakout rooms. All right. Welcome back, everyone. It's nice. I feel like after dyads, people are a little more lively because they've like engaged the material. So it's a pleasure to see you all. So then I'd like to maybe start by inviting folks to drop into the chat. Um, some of the sensations that you noticed in your body when we were resourcing. So whether it was like contraction, expansion, or breathing shallow or deep, or um, could be maybe some of the places where you typically hold tension, like your jaw, your shoulders kind of migrated down. Warmth, stomach ache, face grimaced, okay. nauseous, relaxed, held, hot, sweaty, regulating my breathing, tightness in chest, possibility towards numbness. So I'm guessing that some of these might be um, also the sensations after you started uh, allowing in the reality of the racist violence, um, regulating my breath, stomach tight, crushed in chest, grounded, fleshy body. Great. Right. So, and then frightened. So if there's anyone who wanted to add the sensations you experienced when you allowed yourself to be touched by the current racist violence, First really settled, then heat, neck pain, twitching legs, very observant, spaciousness, heartbeat became stronger. Look down, wanted to get away, yeah, it's very observant. Um, weight on back and shoulders, fast breathing, ache behind eyes. Great. So the beauty of your observations is you're speaking the language of the survival brain. Survival brain speaks in body sensations. And we can do exercises over time to help settle our nervous system. And we, we call it like a resilient zone, like a zone where at times we might be relaxed or stressed, but we still kind of have access to our thinking brain 
and access to our best self. But often the topic of race comes up, just the topic, not even like a, a violence, but someone calling you white, you know, like, oh, yeah, when your white friend came over, and then people like have this knee-jerk wincing. You know? um, so that kind of reaction can kick us out of this zone. And that's when our survival brain hijacks our thinking brain. And even when we're sitting in meditation, if our survival brain is hijacking our thinking brain, then it's difficult to relax into our essence into our innate goodness. So developing these skills has multiple benefits. Um, then in regard to the, the second round of questions, uh, what, would what would it mean if learning to tune into the body and settle the nervous system were a, uh, a requirement? for us to have sustained racial justice in this country, for us to be able to see the humanity in each other. And um, maybe I'll ask if there are a couple of volunteers who'd like to speak to that. Maybe you can raise your hand. Um, it, it sounds to me like part of what you've done is practice speaking up instead of being silent do you notice any benefit like do you notice that you're in alignment with your deeper core values and then how does that affect your body uh, so we have a range of experience here i'm glad that some are now inspired to engage it more deeply and some of you are already doing so i think what i'm going to do um because i didn't know that you had this uh, level of background is I'm going to open it up to um, Stacy and Io if you have any challenging questions that you'd like some of us to engage in dyads um, or in triads or as a group. I know that uh, the two of you were the ones who had the initial vision for the Truth and Justice Vigil. And uh, I would like this, this session to kind of support the arc of that vision. And if you don't have any specifics, I'm happy to continue, but I just thought that I would uh, offer that opportunity if you, because you're the one, you know, Stacy, especially, you live there and you know, you know, what's been happening at the center and what some of the patterns are. And I get the impression that, you know, there are folks who want to be pushing their growth edge. So now's a, a good, ripe moment. Well, I, I do want to acknowledge that not everyone here is. Uh, participating in Begin With Your Body, which Anne is, has been a seven month long book study of Resma Menachem's book, uh, My Grandmother's Hand. Um, and so, uh, the, and that's the reference to the small group. So one week, a, a large group meets, which is almost a hundred people. And then on the alternate weeks, there's smaller groups. And I would really encourage you, if you haven't picked up the book, to pick up the book. And if you know other bodies and deans who are interested in this exploration, that you don't need IO or myself or a group of teachers to lead you in it. What's actually remarkable about Resmus' book is that he has uh, mindful body practices built into every single chapter. And as a matter of fact, Anouk used one, the humming and rocking is one of the practices that Resma offers to bring us back to the body. So that's, that's the one thing, just to acknowledge that not everyone here is part of that conversation. Um, and then I think that there was a lot of richness in the, and I appreciate people's honest disclosure about the body sensations and thinking about um, the reality of, of our world. And so I, I think that, you know, we practice so that we break the habit of turning away, you know, turning off the television or not going to the protest or having ice cream, whatever it is, when that tension arises in the body, when the legs start shaking, when we're feeling anxious and tight, and what is the incentive to stay with that feeling, right? Versus 
turn away, to go find comfort. Um, and so I, I think it's important to like hear that from one another and name that. Um, did Stacy drop off or is it just my, oh, she did. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll pick up where she left off. Um, so I think both there are the, the body sensations that were shared that are um, contraction and unpleasant. And then what I found interesting, for example, um, when I asked uh, Joe in a follow-up, how was it when you started implementing this? And when he shared that initially, of course, is, um, I'm paraphrasing, that it could be intimidating um, that with time, when he had the courage to like open up and, and speak up, that it became energizing. And it's because when, when we have that fear, when it's like, oh, you know, those people, they, they're good people or they don't mean it or I don't wanna make them uncomfortable or I feel uncomfortable, I'm not sure what to do. All of that contraction, literally, it stops the life force in our body. And when we begin to open, then there's literally space in our body for more of the life force to come through. And when we make that space, we can also be a lot more creative in our approach. It allows us to envision things that might not have even occurred to us. It allows us to make connections with other people, to create coalitions, to bring about this change that we're looking for. As a, a person of color, it, it just feels like white people for so long have had the option of not tuning into the humanity of others, not tuning into the lived experiences of others. And in Buddhism, you know, we claim to want liberation for all sentient beings. We have that aspiration, but in practice, if we can't see each other as human and we have that kind of fear automatic response, um, then we're, we're turning a blind eye. And uh, so it is, it is refreshing that uh, a few more white folks are starting to wake up more to the lived experience and have the courage to stick with it. And I appreciated someone talking about something like stay the course or keep going. And that is part of the spirit of what we need. And I just, Irma, I have to say, <laughs> I think it's really big hearted of you <laughs> to say that it, it softened your heart. I think that's really, that's very touching. And, and when you were speaking to, again, that humanitarian aspect, um, it's, it's a deeper lens. I'll just, uh, make a, a quick note about um, that sometimes some white people think that they're complimenting me when they say, I don't see your color. And what I would suggest is, uh, I think that there's like a, a Zen adage of first there was a mountain and then there was no mountain and then there was a mountain. <laughs> and, uh, and so my lived experience is as a person of color. It is not the um, totality of my being or my identity. Um, but to not see my color, often when a white person says that, they, they think that they're saying, oh, I see you as a human. But often what they're actually saying is, oh, I'm assuming that you have similar experience and I'm not taking in your, your lived experience into account. And so there's something about um, like, of respecting that, you know, and seeing deeper to my humanity, not having that me being a person of color as a barrier. So that then when they they come back to, you know, and then there was a mountain, it's like, yes, you know, she she has this lived experience and there's a connection. I feel that that humanitarian connection. Yeah.
And another thing that I think came up in one of the sharings was once you begin to speak up, you start realizing how often small comments are being made that are being condoned by no one speaking out, racist comments um, with no one speaking out against them. And so that's also, I think, for those of us on the spectrum of not having spoken up so much yet, it might be interesting for you to hear that and say, wow, I doubt that they're hanging around people who are all that different from you know, the white folks in my circle. So I wonder if I have, in a sense, not developed the attunement to it. And some of that might be from the unconscious desire to just stay safe or stay in a comfort zone because a lot of white people have that option that a lot of people of color don't have. And I'll also just honor Irma about um, that when you, you said that the place that you were coming from when it was from anger, because I believe that there are things that you said that were wise, you know, like, guess what? I'm not just about the food. <laughs> I'm a whole person, I have a lot to me. Um, and when we begin to drop into a bigger, like in the meditation, I don't know if, if some of you kind of dropped into, like relaxed into this ground of being or your innate goodness or that which is bigger than all of your different personality parts, there's a freedom there. There is a freedom. And when like there, there is reason to feel angry. And there are times when our anger gives us clarity and energy. Um, but can we over time develop the capacity to be rooted in something deeper than that? So that it might, the action may look the same, but it's coming from a different place. And again, then it, it's about our healing. And the more that we heal ourselves, the more that healing ripples out to others. And I believe that, you know, as, as Buddhists, then we all realize that we all have different emotions and we're on a path to help transform our relationship with it. So it's beautiful that we're willing to, to engage that wherever we're at. When I saw in the chat that uh, someone was mentioning as white body people, I'm gaining community of white people helping me do this work and keeping me engaged and also joining with BIPOC, so I gain love. And so again, there are some pretty profound benefits. And this, this analogy may seem a little superficial, but even like when people say wanna to go to the gym, if you get a friend to go do it with you, then <laughs> you're more likely to stick with it in the long haul. And we are social creatures. And so definitely developing community of people with similar values who are trying to do it for the long haul makes a big difference. So we just have a couple more minutes. I wanna ask if anyone has any questions. Okay. So I'm just gonna drop uh, a few resources in the chat. One of them is already there. So I really appreciate um, the question, Aya, and I appreciate people sharing. And, uh, and also just to, to make space that, you know, as someone mentioned, sometimes we can have uh, responses from different parts of us. A part of us might feel like a little painful um, and another part of us might feel a lot of gratitude. And um, so just, I'd love to, honor Irma again for speaking up for your courage and uh, your heart. Uh, and I know that we are at time. So I'd like us all to dedicate the merit. And as we do that, I really invite us to imagine, like someone said that she was an energy worker, like to almost imagine whatever openings that we've had through this gathering uh, this gathering of this group, some of you have been working together, that may that sense of trust, may that sense of, wow, I could tell that she was speaking from a place of truth or 
whatever opening you may have had, um, then may all beings be able to experience that throughout my many lives and until this moment, any merit I have accomplished, including any generated by this practice and all that I will ever attain. This I offer for the welfare of sentient beings. May sickness, war, famine, and suffering be decreased for every being while their wisdom and compassion increase in this and every future life. Thank you all for your time, your dedication. Thank you so very much, Anouk, for your wisdom, for holding space, and all of you for showing up and being brave. Um, just a quick uh, honoring of uh, the support for the center. You know that Common Ground Meditation Center operates uh, completely on donations of folks just like you. Um, and if you'd like to support not only the center, but most importantly, Anouk's livelihood, please visit the Common Ground Meditation Center website. Uh, Gabe has dropped a link into the chat as well, and you can indicate Anouk. She will receive two thirds of any Donna that is offered this evening. Common Ground will keep a third for operations. Mm, thank you so much, everyone.